Good morning. One of the many Facebook posts I've seen this week uh, made a really interesting point about what we read and the effect that what we read has on us. It pointed out that if we spend a lot of time reading the news, what it tends to do is make us feel anxious and stressed uh, because of all the things we read about. But when we spend time reading God's word, we find the opposite to be true. Uh, it gives us peace and confidence. Now, I guess there might be some people watching this who think that actually all that is is a form of escapism. Uh, reading the Bible instead of the news is a way of getting away from the realities of, of what's going on in the world around us and uh, the situation that is changing so many lives. But actually, as a Christian, I want to say I'm absolutely sure that what I read in my Bible is more real, more certain, and more important than anything that I might read in our newspapers. And so this morning, uh, we have a chance now to come to God's Word and to see something that is real and certain and far more important than anything else that we might come across. I know that last Sunday I said we're beginning a sermon series on the book of James. Uh, today I'm going to say we're going to take a break from the sermon series on the book of James. It seems strange to do that after only one week. Uh, but we will, God willing, come back to the rest of James in coming weeks. But I want to make the most of the opportunity to today to think about Palm Sunday and what that really shows us. And then next Sunday, we will be celebrating Easter together. Uh, and then at some point beyond that, uh, hopefully we'll come back to James. So today, Palm Sunday, you'll be glad to know that just before the pandemic, I ordered a whole load of palm crosses and they're sitting in a box in church ready for us. Shame that we can't get to them. Uh, you're very welcome to have one once we're out of this pandemic. Um, but I've asked uh, Anna to read uh, the Bible reading for us today. So we're going to, to watch that. Uh, it's Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. And then uh, I'll come back and share a few thoughts about it. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said. And they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thanks, Anna. A church I used to be part of once did an all-age service on Palm Sunday based on that reading that Anna's just read. And uh, slightly unwisely, the church decided it would be really helpful to have a real live donkey for it. Uh, so a donkey was brought in, um, and the thing about this donkey is it wasn't house trained. And when nature called, the donkey had no inhibitions about relieving himself there and then in church. And this was a church that, like many of its age, uh, was heated by big pipes that ran underneath grills in the floor. And of course, you can imagine uh, that what the donkey did went down uh, the grill and stayed there for quite a long time. And to this day, when the heating is first turned on at the start of every winter, there is an unmistakable agricultural odour that pervades the church. Uh, on that occasion, the donkey was very much the star of the show, albeit for not great reasons. But actually, in the passage that we've just looked at, 
it's not the donkey that's the star of the show at all, is it? It's Jesus. And I want us to, to look at this passage really with the question in mind, how does this help us understand more of who Jesus really is? And what does that mean for us, particularly during this pandemic? Well, as we look at the passage, uh, we see the easiest way probably to sum up what the passage says about who Jesus is, is that he is the king who came to save us. Jesus is the king who came to save us. Let's have a look and see how Mark shows us that, shall we? Have you ever wondered why the donkey in that passage gets so much attention? I mean, if you pulled that story forward 2,000 years through time to today and you replace the donkey with a car, which is what we tend to get around in, the level of detail Mark seems to give us is not only where would we find the car parked, but also who should we go and collect the keys from and what should we do once we get into the car and want to drive it away. Why does Mark give us so much trivial detail as it seems. Why does Mark, who is the most concise of all the gospel readers, Mark who who tells the story of Jesus in 16 chapters, whereas Matthew takes 28, and Mark who, when it comes to editing, seems to be pretty ruthless. Uh, if it's not absolutely essential to the story, he, he cuts it out. Um, why does Mark, who is so careful to be as concise as possible, why does he give us these details about where the donkey is, how it needs to be collected, and so on? Why didn't Mark just say Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey? Presumably that would cover the essentials. Well, it's because the details that might seem to us to be trivial are actually not that trivial at all. Mark wants us to see that Jesus didn't just borrow or commandeer a donkey that happened to be passing. Actually, it was all arranged. It was all planned and it had very deep significance. So firstly, Mark tells us where the donkey, sorry, that the donkey was tied up and that the disciples were to go and untie it. Now that seems pretty trivial, doesn't it? It's almost like saying you'll find a car parked and by the way, the handbrake will be on and when you get into it, the first thing you'll need to do is release the handbrake. That seems an odd thing, odd level of detail to record, doesn't it? I know that in the Gospels, the disciples don't always come across as the sharpest tools in the box, but I'm pretty confident that even they, if they found a donkey that had been tied up, they would have known that what they needed to do was untie it. So why does Mark record it? Why does Mark tell us all of that? Well, it's because there is another seemingly trivial reference to a donkey being tied up in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49 is Jacob blessing his sons shortly before he dies. And to each of his 12 sons, uh, who went on to become the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob gave some sort of prophetic message. And when he came to Judah, he started off by talking about how the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff. He, he was prophesying that great kings of Israel would come from the tribe of Judah. And that is certainly true. David and all the others who would in turn point to the one true king, the Messiah, that God would one day send and who would receive the obedience of the nations, uh, those all were descended from, Je from Judah. So Jacob gives this prophecy and then he starts talking very randomly, it seems, in, in verse 11 of Genesis 49. He starts talking about where this messianic king would tie his donkey. Why? Why does he tell us that? Well, the significance of the disciples being sent to fetch a donkey that had been tied up was probably entirely lost on us. 
but it would not have been missed by the people who saw it in Jesus's day, especially not with all the other things that were about to happen. So let's read on and we'll see uh, a few more details. We're told that this was a donkey that no one had ever ridden, verse 2. Now, in the Old Testament, there was an ancient provision that an animal used for uh, a sacred purpose should be one that had not previously been used for an ordinary purpose. And Mark then, when he tells us that it's a donkey that no one had ridden, uh, is wanting us to see that this donkey wasn't just any old donkey, that had been, uh, but one that had been set aside for a special purpose, for a sacred purpose. So that these little details that seem so trivial about the donkey are actually not that trivial at all. They are telling us that something special is happening. They're telling us that this donkey and Jesus riding it was a fulfilment of the prophecy that Jacob had made uh, about his son Judah. And the fact that the donkey had never been ridden is telling us that this donkey was doing something special, something sacred. Now, you might think I'm reading an awful lot into that and uh, I'm making more of it than is really needed. And if you're thinking that, why don't you have a look in your own time at Matthew's accounts of the same uh, events? Uh, You can read them in Matthew chapter 21. And when you have a look at that, you'll see that Matthew uh, starts in the same way. He starts by talking about this donkey that has been tied up and so on. But then when he gets to verse 4, he tells us this. This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Mark, if you like, just assumes that we'll pick up on these references. But Matthew spells it out for us in black and white. He's saying, look, this business with the donkey is not trivial or irrelevant. It is all fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy. And it's all happening to show us that Jesus is fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy. Now let's look for a moment at the passage that Matthew quotes. Uh, It comes from the Old Testament book of Zechariah. And I don't know how familiar you are with Zechariah, so I'll tell you a bit about it. Zechariah was God's word to the Jews, the people of Israel, who had just returned home from exile in Babylon. They've come back to the promised land and they're starting to rebuild it. And what God says to these guys as they're rebuilding the temple and so on is firstly, look, it's not enough just physically to come back to the promised land and to rebuild the temple and so on. That in itself is not enough. You also need spiritually to come back to God with your heart. That's the first thing that God was saying through Zechariah. But... At the same time as saying that, he said something else. These people of Israel were facing opposition. And God, through Zechariah, encouraged them with the promise that his king, the Messiah, would one day come to Jerusalem and to the temple. He's saying, look guys, I know that you're having a hard time at the moment, but don't worry, keep going because one day my king will come. Let me read what he says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That was Zechariah. Uh, It was Zechariah 9.9, by the way. But do you see what's happening now in, in the New Testament? The donkey business, it is not trivial detail. It's very important because it is showing us that this man, Jesus, riding into Jerusalem, is no ordinary man. He is the king that God had promised. 
He's the king that Genesis 49 was speaking to when when Jacob made that prophecy to his son Judah. He's the king that Zechariah was speaking to as he encouraged the struggling people of Israel. And so the donkey is Jesus's way of showing us who he really is. He is God's king coming to his people. Now, there's an important word in the verse in Zechariah that the crowds pick up on as they start shouting to Jesus. They pick up on the words of Zechariah, but actually they start shouting words from Psalm 118. And we need to to turn to that and see, see what's going on there. We've seen that Jesus is God's king, but now we need to see that Jesus is God's king who came to be our saviour. God's king who came to be our saviour. The word in Zechariah that we mustn't miss is salvation. Zechariah said, see your king comes to you righteous and having salvation. So the king had come to save his people. And that's what the crowds picked up on when they start shouting out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're shouting verses from Psalm 118. And the word Hosanna is simply a a form of the Hebrew word for save us. So if you uh, read the verse as it is actually in the psalm, you'll see what I mean. Psalm 118 verse 25 says this, O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So do you see what's happened? Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, just as the Old Testament had predicted the Messiah would one day do. And the crowd saw it and they realised what it means. They realised that the king that would come to Jerusalem with salvation, the king that would come to his people and save them, had arrived. They realised that that's exactly what was happening as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And as they realised that that's what he had come to do, they did the obvious thing. They shouted out, save us, Hosanna. Come on, Jesus, they said. We know you've come to save your people, so save us. Hosanna. Now, the point here, and we really mustn't miss this, is that Jesus is God's king and he came with a particular purpose in mind. He didn't just come to be acknowledged as king. He didn't just come to be worshipped as king although he certainly did come for those things but above all he came as a saviour he came to save and as the events of the rest of that week uh, show us the way he would be our saviour was by going to the cross dying in our place on good friday and then rising again for our eternal life on Easter Sunday. And we'll pick up uh, on those wonderful truths later in the week. Watch our website and our social media uh, for more information about that. But look, if what we've just seen is that Jesus is God's King who came to be our Saviour. What does that mean for us today? And what does that mean for us, especially in this time of pandemic? Well, I think there are three things that I I would just like to encourage you to ponder and give some time to thinking about. The first one is we should be hugely reassured and encouraged that in Jesus we have a king who uses his authority to save his people. He uses his power, his might and his authority to save his people. We uh, here in the Vicarage have been watching uh, this past week uh, the BBC series Wolf Hall, uh, which is talking about Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell and uh, particularly how Henry got rid of Anne Boleyn, his second wife, because, well, quite frankly, he wanted to marry someone else who would give him a male heir. What we see in Henry VIII was a king 
who used his power to get his own way. He used his power for his own benefit. In Jesus, we see exactly the opposite sort of king. We see a king who used power that was far greater than Henry VIII's, but he uses it not for his own benefit. He uses it to save his people. And what that means for us in this pandemic is that we need to remember Jesus is a king who is wholly bent on salvation. He is a king who is all about saving his people. And what that means is that we can turn to him today, whether it's for the first time or the thousandth time or the hundred thousandth time. It doesn't matter uh, whether we're just beginning to turn to him or whether we've been turning to him for our whole life. But we can turn to him knowing that he is the most powerful king there's ever been and his power is at work to save his people. It has been wonderful in these past weeks when we've met online every weekday morning for a half hour of prayer. It's been wonderful to hear day after day people uh, with accounts of how God has answered our prayers. We've prayed for something on Tuesday and on Wednesday we've heard how God has answered that prayer. I'm absolutely sure that as the weeks go by during this pandemic... We will have more and more stories to tell of how Jesus has heard our prayers and intervened in wonderful ways. We have a saviour who uses his power to save. We have a king who uses his power to save. So today, whether it's for the first time or the thousandth, we can turn to him asking for help. That's the first thing I think we need to remember from this passage. Secondly, we need to remember the price that Jesus was willing to pay to save his people. We have seen in recent weeks the government spending unprecedented amounts of money in trying to uh, make sure that people's salaries are paid, trying to uh, shore up businesses, trying to shore up the economy. Huge amounts of money beyond what any of us, I suspect, would have dreamt of a month or two ago. But do you see the price that Jesus was willing to pay to save his people? Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey was him riding to his death. Palm Sunday leads to Good Friday. The donkey leads to the cross. In Romans... The Apostle Paul makes the point that if God is willing to give us his own son to save us, then do we really think God is going to withhold any good thing from us? If he has already paid such a great price for us, do we really think he's going to be mean in response to any other prayer that we may offer? Jesus is the king not only who came to save but the king who came to save at great cost so we can be confident of his ongoing work in our lives today. But the third and final and perhaps the most important thing we need to remember going forward from today is the biggest thing that Jesus came to save us from. Because of course his death on Good Friday was not primarily about saving people from a pandemic, from a virus, from unemployment, from financial ruin or anything else. His death on Good Friday was about saving us from our sin. Jesus is the king who came to save us at great cost from our sin. He came to save us so that we can be forgiven. And we can look forward to eternity with him in paradise. We can look forward to an eternity in a world where there are no more pandemics. In fact, there is no more illness, no more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more fear, no more of any of the bad things we're experiencing at the moment. 
So this Palm Sunday, we need to remember that Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey is Jesus' way of showing us that he is God's king who came to save his people. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus to be your Messiah, your King and our Saviour. I pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us, whether it is for the first time or for the thousandth, to cry out with those crowds all those years ago, Hosanna, save us, King Jesus. We pray, Lord, for you to save us in the challenging and painful and anxious moments that we face right now. We pray for your help and your rescue. But above all, we want to thank you that in going to the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sin so that we can be saved from it and brought to eternal life in a perfect world, free from the things that we dread today. We thank you and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to uh, respond to what we've seen in God's word in a few different ways. In a moment, Catherine is going to lead us in prayer. After that, we will hand over to Kate and Ali, uh, who will lead us in uh, something to help the children uh, think this through. And while that's going on, uh, you're welcome either to watch what they're doing with the kids or to join us on a Zoom conversation, which will be a chance for members of the church family to catch up with one another, uh, to encourage each other and to pray for one another. There will also be in the comments below this video a couple of YouTube playlists with some songs that we thought might be fitting for today and uh, you might want to uh, watch them and sing along as part of your own worship. You might like to just watch them and listen to them and and think about them as you pray uh, quietly yourself. Uh, but either way, they're there and there'll be some songs that are chosen for adults and a separate playlist with songs that are chosen for children. So, uh, in a moment, I'll hand to Catherine, then to Kate, and then do join us um, by Zoom uh, to chat and pray together if you would like. Thank you so much for listening. Hello everybody, um, you find me at my temporary working from home desk uh, in the spare room of the vicarage. Uh, Henry has asked me to lead us in prayer for a few things. Um, so I'm going to pray for a few subjects and at the end of each section I will say Amen. Um, but if you want to pray longer for those things, um, either by yourself or uh, with the others in your house or the people you're watching this with, um, then feel free to pause the video at any point. Uh, and pray um, and then press play again when you're ready to move on to praying for the next thing. I'm going to finish our time in prayer by praying the collect uh, and leading us in praying the Lord's Prayer together as well. Um, so even though this is a recording and I won't be able to hear you uh, and we won't be able to hear each other, please still pray out loud uh, if you want to. So let's pray. Father God, we pray for our world. We know in Romans 8 that it says that creation groans uh, while it is in suffering and pain and waiting for you to make everything right. And we feel that more than ever at the moment. Lord God, our world is one where there is so much suffering and evil and destruction and chaos, where there is violence and injustice and pain and disasters that are happening beyond our control. But Lord God, we know that you are in control that you are sovereign over everything. And we pray that you would act. Lord, we pray that you would send your light and life into our dark and broken and hurting world. We pray that you would send your church to the lost and that you would help us to truly walk by faith and bear fruit for your kingdom. Father, would you help us to shine for Jesus, whether life is easy for, for us or whether it is hard. Help us uh, to spread your gospel to those who need to know it, those who need to come to you to be saved. And Father, in everything, would you show that you alone 
our Lord and God. Amen. Father, we pray for this coronavirus pandemic. Lord, we pray that you would bring it to an end soon. Father, would you limit where it spreads? Would you protect the places that will be most devastated by it, where the most people would die, where most people are vulnerable, where it would cause far worse suffering than it has already? Father, we pray that people will quickly be able to find a cure for it and ways of treating it so that people can get better. Lord, we pray that you would be with our government and help them to make the right decisions at the right time, to do things that are wise and prudent, to do things that benefit people genuinely and that aren't selfish. Father, would you sustain everybody who is working so hard uh, to treat people, to help those treating people, everybody working for the NHS and in our hospitals and in associated things. Father, would you give them the strength that they need to serve? Would you be able to help them to rest really well when they need the rest? Father, we pray for those who are sick with this virus or those who, whose treatment will be affected by this virus. Lord, we pray for healing. Father, we pray that, that outside, of this, uh, outside of infection, hospitals would be unusually quiet for this time of year. That you would keep other cases that were coming quiet. Um, so that resources can go to where they are needed most. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones recently. Lord, we pray that you would comfort those who are grieving. Father, we pray that as they are asking why, they would reach out for answers and they would find you and that they would find the only true healing that we have that comes from Jesus. Father, we pray for people to be turning to you uh, amazingly throughout all of this so that more people would be saved. Father, we pray for those who have either been put on furlough who, or who have lost their jobs recently. Father, would you give them hope? Or would you, would you help them to find what their purpose is? For those who trust you, would you help them to, to understand what you are doing in their lives at the moment? And for those who don't, as they search for meaning, I pray that they would find that our only value, uh, our only security is in you and that you are the one who gives us so much meaning and so much love. Amen. And Father, we pray for our mission partners, Tony and Kath Swanson in Uganda. Lord God, we thank you that they have been able to work from home. And we pray that you would help them to work effectively in whatever ways they can, whatever that looks like now. Lord, we thank you that they've been able to have fellowship with their church uh, remotely online. And Lord, I pray that those relationships would be a blessing to them, that they would be strengthened and encouraged by their church family in Uganda, even though they can't see them in person. Lord, we thank you for the ways that they've been able to serve practically so far. And uh, I pray that you would show them what they can do to show your love to friends and neighbours and others around them. Father, we pray that you would protect them from getting ill. And we pray that you protect uh, those in Uganda from getting ill as well. Lord, they've said that people are nervous. Um, and we know that Uganda is a place that is less resourced than we are. So, Father, we pray that you would uh, prevent the coronavirus from spreading widely there. And Lord, I pray that you would help Tony and Kath to exude your peace to those around them, to show their trust in you uh, and to be able to speak of your sovereignty and of your power um, to those who need to know you it most. Amen. And let's draw our prayers together by praying the collect together. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, Grant us the faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. And let's finish our time together by praying the Lord's Prayer. So as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Okay, thanks Catherine. Hello everyone at home. We have come to talk to the children, but everybody's welcome to stay. You never know, you might get something out of it. Great. So children, are you feeling wriggly? Let's jump up. Let's move our bodies a bit. And today we've got a story about people walking along and shouting and waving. So we're going to do a bit of that. Okay, let's walk around a bit. Have you got a little space you can walk around? Great. Now let's try waving our arms and walking around a bit. That's it. Now can you put your hands to your mouth and do a bit of shouting? Hooray! Hooray! Woo! Praise Woo! God! Woo! Hooray! Praise God! Hooray! Hooray! A bit more waving and a bit of jumping up and down. <laughs> Woo! Oh, and well done. One. Now we're going to sit down again and we're going to switch <gasps> on our listening <gasps> ears. Are you ready? You switch on your listening ears. Good job. Okay, today we're going to talk about rescuers because we're going to talk about how Jesus came to rescue us. So I'm going to put up some pictures of different rescuers and see if you know who they are. The first one's coming now. Who's this? You're right if you said it's the Paw Patrol. Maybe you've got a favourite pup in Paw Patrol. I was thinking about this earlier and I think my favourite might be Zuma because I really like his underwater bone that he uses. Now the second picture. Who's this? It's the Octonauts. Octonauts. Hooray, have you got a favourite Octonaut, Ellie? Probably the captain. Captain Barnacles. Or Quasi. Or Quasi, he's quite funny, isn't he? Right, picture number three. It's Superman. He's a really good superhero, isn't he? He rescues Don't worry, people. it's the only Marvel. Yeah, there's... Oh, um, but there are loads of superheroes, aren't there? I know Debs knows them all because she watches well, all no those films. There's no superhero left. Yeah. Now, the next picture is of some real rescuers. Picture number four. Who's this? Fire! That's right, it's firefighters. You can see their fire engine behind them, can't you? And they're wearing their uniforms, ready to rescue people from fire. I think they can see so, like, on the same... Number five. It's a special kind of boat. Lifeboat! That's it, it's a lifeboat. There are people called the RNLI whose job it is to rescue us if we get in trouble at sea. Brilliant. Well done, everybody. So... It's story time now, and I'm going to make some signs while I tell you the story, and I'd like you to try and copy them at home. I'm going to teach you the two most important ones. So the first one is King. We do this at St Mary's, don't we, in the Lord's Prayer. If we want I've to say King, got this. we do that. Ali's going to wear his crown that he's made. No. And the other one is a really important word for today's story. It's rescue. You start with your arms crossed like this. I thought it was rescue. Then you make fists. And then you pull your arms out like you're rescuing. So let's try that again. I rescue or rescuing or rescuer. All about rescuing. One more time. That's rescue. Okay. So you try and do the actions with me while I'm telling you the story. A long, long, long time ago, about 500 years before Jesus lived, God had made a promise to his people. God promised that one day he would send a king to rescue his people. And this king would be humble and peaceful, riding on a donkey. This is donkey. Wow. You do donkey. You can read this promise in the Bible in Zechariah 9 verse 9. Do you think God was going to keep that promise? Yeah. Yes, or no, or maybe. Yeah. Ali thinks yes. You're right, Ali. It's cool in a song. God always keeps his promises. That's right, yeah, we learned that song at church, didn't we? Yes, God kept his promise and he kept it when Jesus was alive. Yeah. One day, Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Yeah! And I lots of people knew that, that he was God's... Rescuing King. 
they were very happy and they shouted things like praise god praise and god they took off their coats and threw them on the ground Whee! and they cut branches from trees and put them on the ground as well to show Psych! the king is coming it's really special now we're going to have a go at acting out that story from the bible i'm Donkey, going to read it out come on! and i want everybody at home to try being in the story come on, donkey. we need one person at your house and at my house to be jesus donkey. Ali, you're going to be Jesus, aren't you? Yeah, no, I'm Jesus. We need maybe one person to be a donkey, or the Jesus can just you're pretend to be a donkey. donkey. Henry, can you come be a donkey? I'll be a donkey. Thank you. <laughs> and we need some people to walk around in front and behind them. You um, actually feel like you're throwing awesome. your clothes yeah. down and, and oh, shouting, oh, hooray. Are you going to wear your crown? Okay, so I'm going oh, to be... Oh, yeah, good point. Oh, you're going to have your crown to be the king. So there's Jesus. There's a donkey. Are you ready at your house? I'm going to be somebody who throws down my clothes in front of them to say the king is coming. There we go. Okay. And now if you're already at home, I'm going to read out the story while you act it out. So, they brought the donkey to Jesus and put their coats on it and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their coats on the road. Others cut branches in the fields and spread them on the road. The people were walking ahead of Jesus and behind him, shouting, Praise God! God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord! God bless the kingdom of our father David! That kingdom is coming! Praise to God in heaven! Well done, everybody. Well done. We're finished. You can get down now, Jesus. Donkeys, you can have a rest. You didn't have to just well tip me off. Well done. Let's sit down again. Good job, everybody at home. Now, oh, listening ears on again. Got your listening ears on? Yes. Good job. Are you ready to do some signs with me again? So, the people in the story were really happy that God's rescuing king had come. We can be really happy too, because we know that Jesus came to rescue us from our sins. If we let Jesus be our king, he cleans up all the bad and naughty things in our hearts and we can live forever and ever and ever with him. Now that makes me really happy. And one of the things I might do if I'm really happy is sing and dance. So how about the song, If You're Happy And You Know It? Can you jump up? Let's get ready to sing, If You're Happy And You Know It. Thanks, Henry. You don't have to do the actions. Come on, you? you're happy. All right, Come we're going to do clap your hands. Then we're going to stamp your feet, then we'll shout hooray, and then we'll see if we can do all three. Ready? If you're happy and, and you know, know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know, know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, it, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Stamp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stamp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stamp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, stamp your feet. Now shout hooray. If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray. Hooray! If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray. Hooray! If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, shout hooray! Hooray! Now, can we do all three? It's clap, clap, stamp, stamp, hooray. Ready? And um, we'll do it a bit faster and a bit higher. If you're happy and, and you know it, do all three. three. Stamp, stamp, hooray. hooray! If you're happy, happy and you know it, do all three. Hooray! If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, do all three. Stamp, stamp. Hooray! Finally! Well done, everybody at home. Great. You can sit down again. And switch on your listening ears again. Thanks, uh, after a lot of times so we have to do this, I know. Well done, everyone. Now, what could we do at home to help ourselves be really happy that Jesus is our rescuing king? I've got some ideas for you. I know! What? Play a game you like a lot, like video games maybe. <laughs> Ali says video games are any excuse for anything. <laughs> Ali would love to play video games. 
but Aww. things that help us remember that Jesus is our rescue and king. So you could do some more singing and dancing at home. And I've put a list of songs for you on YouTube so that you can sing and dance along with them. You could make a crown like Ali's done. I thought you could write Jesus is my king or Jesus is my rescuer. I said I think Jesus rules. Yeah, Ali wrote something a bit strange like a it's caveman, caveman talk. talk. You did, caveman talk. Um, or you could act out the story again like we did before and take turns to be the one who's Jesus or be the one who's the donkey or the one who's doing the shouting. Yeah, you have one donkey. Um, also, I've done you some colouring sheets of the rescuers that we talked about earlier. Um, parents, you can download all of these things from our website. So, uh, hang on, www.smwp.co.uk. Um, that's all there. Now, it's almost time to say goodbye, but first... We're going to talk to God together. So can you get in to a position that you'd like to be in for praying and thanking Jesus? A really happy praying position. So you can stand up, you can even put your arms right up in the air, or you can get down on your knees, or you can put your hands together. Do whatever you'd like to do to get ready to thank Jesus with a happy prayer. Are you ready? Okay. Dear Jesus, we praise you because you are our rescuing king. We thank you that when you are the king of our lives, you rescue us from our sins and we can live with you forever and ever. Amen. Great. Amen. Well done, everybody. Now, next weekend is really exciting. It's going to be Easter. Easter! So we're going to have special things at church on video for you to watch on Friday. We're going to be talking about the beginning of the Easter story when Jesus died and I'll show you some things to make that you can keep all weekend. And on Saturday, we're going to watch um, Gemma read a story. And on Sunday, it's the most special, most exciting day of the year, I think. We can put our party clothes on because we're going to be celebrating that Jesus came alive again. Oh, Ali, don't tickle my feet. Oh, you horror. So it's time to say goodbye. Thank you for watching St Mary's this morning. And if you're watching on Sunday morning, it's now time to go over to say hello to other people from church on Zoom. So whether we're going to see you on Zoom or not, thanks for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>